I'm going to get us started and we'll, we'll just roll a little slowly here for the first minute or so, because I still see folks coming in, um, which is fantastic. Um, so welcome. Um, we're here to, to chat today about um, OSF discovery. Uh, so some really cool new features that we've launched in the last few weeks. And related to that, how um, you or the researchers that you support in your community, how you take advantage of these cool um, uh, discovery features that are in the OSF and beyond. Um, so we'll we'll talk a little bit about those as well. This is great, all these introductions, it's really fantastic. Um, see Vietnam, that's probably the, and Zambia from really coming from all over. This is really fantastic. Uh, thank you for all of those. Um, so just very quickly about myself um, and I put my info in here if you wanna um, learn more about uh, who I am and what I'm about, uh, but I'm the product manager here at, at the Center for Open Science and uh, support the OSF that we're gonna talk about today and our other infrastructure priorities. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what the OSF is, you know, what our focus is with that infrastructure here shortly um, and how we make our you know priorities and our decisions as we build new things because folks like you are a very big part um, of our our direction and I just facilitate um, what the kinds of needs and uh, exciting priorities that you guys have um, in your own research communities. Um, so my info is there if you want to reach out to me. I'm I'm happy to chat with you about the things that we're covering today, but you know, anything you you want to talk about, my team is uh is happy to talk chat with you. Um so what we're gonna to look at today in particular um is what this OSF search uh, that we've just launched uh, is capable of. I'm gonna you know, give you some of the the basics, um, an outline of what those are about, but then also I'll I'll jump in there live and and show you um, some examples. Um, so we'll we'll talk a little bit about those, um, and then you know how yourself or the researchers that you work with how to leverage the tools that are in the OSF um, to take advantage of that discovery that's in within the OSF as well as. Uh, other indexes and discovery. Um, there will be a couple more webinars that are similar to this uh, next month that um, are you know, tilting the, the frame a little bit um, to be um, more targeted toward um, program officers that work with nonprofits and, and funders and how discovery is unique to their, um, their needs um, as well as institutional you know, support like librarians and data management support. Um, so those are coming um, next month. You're going to see some of the same stuff that you would uh, see here if you want to come and join us for those, but also some unique content as well. Um, so very quickly, just tell you a little bit about the OSF if you um, have not heard of us before. Um, so the OSF is a, it's a free open source online uh, research platform and it sits among many uh, tools that sound, you know, that description would fit. Um, the unique concept uh, behind the OSF is that uh, the goal is to, to support researchers transparently as in their work across the entire research life cycle. So um, there are workflows for research planning and documenting um, what you intend to do with your analyses, um, and then uh, for data, active data management and collaboration and um, work with your uh, research teams and then um, you know, sharing your, your outputs in a number of ways, data archiving, sharing, uh, preprints and other methods. And then finally, being able to report those and make those visible and available for your institutions and your communities and other, other kinds of communities um, in multiple ways. Um, and so that that really is, uh, we stand alone in sort of tackling all, trying to, to provide tools across all of those different um, phases of the research lifecycle. Um, and then we integrate tools that do particular parts really well too. So citation management and active data storage and data archiving, we have integrations into Dataverse and 
OneDrive and Google Drive and Zotero and Mendeley, uh, Mendeley um, for example. So we know when others are doing um, parts of this really well, we want to integrate those into the OSF as well. And so just to give you an idea of where our priorities come from um, when we are making decisions like this, this new search feature, so I'm going to tell you about, uh, um, is really a, a confluence of a number of things. Um, so we're looking at a number of, these are really big, broad buckets here, and then lots of specific actors within here. But um, we have those integrators and interoperable opportunities, like I just mentioned. Uh, we have members, uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about those shortly, but um, we have uh, preprints and institutions and registries, archives that run their own content using our OSF uh, infrastructure. Um, so they are one of our stakeholders, obviously. Um, and then uh, the data contributors, users that are adding and making, sharing their data on OSF and other content uh, and then consumers, those that are reading their content and downloading it and try to reproduce it and discuss it. And when you sort of look at the the dialogue between all of these different groups, um, that's really where, where we're trying to make uh, decisions and priorities on how we continue to improve the OSF um, rather than us taking a guess at what you guys need and, um, and putting that out there and just seeing what happens. Uh, that really is not our our approach at all. Um, we, this is a constant conversation across these groups um, and then building the OSF toward where their, those needs are in these broad um, communities. So you'll see some of uh, some examples here in, in uh, the search project that we've just launched. Um, and I didn't include here some um, the screenshots of the old search, but if you have used the OSF prior to a few weeks ago, um, search had a number of, of barriers. And um, I'm actually going to ask you to use the chat here while I'm chat or while I'm covering this. So tell me a little bit about um, some of the barriers, just in a sentence or two in the chat. What are the frustrations or barriers or um, complaints that you have on just research discovery that not on the OSF in particular, although if you have uh, criticism of OSF search, I can take it, uh, please do share it. Um, but just generally, you know, in a sentence and a phrase, what is it that's, um, you know, causes frustration for you when you're trying to discover research content? And then I'll come back around to, to some of those. Um, if there's some some really good ones in there. Um, we might discuss those later, but uh, we hear a lot of that um, from OSF users, things that were problematic uh, when they were trying to use OSF search for discovering content that they wanted to build you know, their research on top of or um, uh, to reproduce, replicate, um, or even determining if they could find their own content um, you know, when they have published or shared it or hoped they did um, on the OSF or elsewhere. And so we you know, were taking in years of data about um, the, the search experience, the discovery experience on OSF. And we had several interfaces, all of which um, really didn't make it uh, as easy as it could be for researchers to take advantage of, of critical uh, features for research discovery. And so um, we, step back and redesign completely our search uh, approach. And um, we're really uh, excited about some of the things that are we're capable of now that, that we're really, um, the OSF couldn't support before. And really you're not gonna find some of these in many um, uh, platforms. Um, so just a few examples here. Um, so obviously the, being able to start with searching for a, a phrase, um, you know, you would hope that any search is going to have something like that. Um, and OSF search is going to, um, will take those in and find not just that exact term, but if there aren't many matches for that, you know, that exact word that you're searching for, it will try to um, find similar terms for you as well, much the same as, um, uh, you know, Google or other search engines will do. Um, we included some of the basic wildcards. There's, there's a whole world of wildcards out there, um, but we included some of the 
really commonly used and requested ones like quotations to have an exact phrase or to uh, um, a minus to exclude something from uh, your results. Um, and then some OSF in particular uh, um, context to like the content type within the OSF. So just one workflow, you can isolate just those. And then some really neat stuff that uh, you're not going to find in a lot of other places but are enabled here on the OSF. Um, so you can filter by the funder uh, that supported the research that's reported by the, uh, the researcher on their content, um, but could be really, really useful um, to be able to filter down by that content and see as you're pursuing a grant from one of the NIH institutes, you could find uh, content on, on OSF that's supported by that exact funder. Um, so it could be very useful. Um, filter by an institution that has uh, affiliates on that content. Um, so that is based on our OSF institutions features, but that's all available as well. Um, you can filter by the, the providers, those, those community service providers that we host on the OSF. You can filter by just some of those particular providers. Um, and then even connected resources, so not even the um, phrases and metadata that's on one particular source, but things they connected to um, and indicated they have relationships to, so like connected data and code and other resources, all of that um, you could filter by and in any combination. So um, you, know, you could find a particular OSF you know, registration that has connected data right. and funded by the NSF. Like that's a combination that you could um, take advantage of. Sorry about the barking dog in the background. Move forward here. Um, and I'm just gonna give you a little um, outline tour here and then we'll we'll jump in and actually look at the search features themselves. Um, I'm just following some of the chat items, some interesting additions in there. Lots about metadata. Um, yeah, good points. Um, so yeah, this is what the the search interface looks like here. You can see our um, if a search term is entered, we actually give you lots of feedback on what your um, current searches or filters are are giving you back. Um, so in this case, that's a very very obviously broad search term with just science. Um, and I'm getting many, many, many results. So after 10,000, we don't give you a specific count. Um, we'll just tell you it's more than 10,000. But once you get under that number by adding um, some of the filters or having a more specific search term, we'll tell you exactly how many results um, you have. And that will continue to update as you add um, additional uh, filters to your query. Um, there's those OSF specific object types on the top um, selector there, and then all of our, our filters for more specific findings. Um, so let me actually jump over to, ooh, got some Zoom stuff in my way. Um, this is our, that same OSF search interface here. This is all live. Um, so I was just gonna take one example here, but I will put this um, link in the chat and you're welcome, uh, beyond welcome, to play around with this as well. Um, so there is the link in the chat. Uh, so just for one example, if I wanted to, to look at um, some research about hearing loss, um, you know, I'm going to get, I have 322 results. Um, that's a lot better than the, you know, thousands and thousands that I start with in the OSF corpus, but still that's too many um, for me to, to really get into and look at each one of these results and find what I, I need. Um, I do have ways to, to get some previews of what's available without even you know opening all of that content, but still that, that's too many. Um, so I can narrow this down to just OSF projects used for, um, often used for active data management collaboration and linking and sharing and papers of their of their data. Um, I'm at down to 116, so I'm, I'm getting there. Um, but what I really would be useful 
um, is if I could see just data, you know, things that were labeled as data by the users. Um, and now I'm really getting down to, um, you know, some, some useful numbers here because only two of them were labeled as uh, data sets. And I could also near, narrow down that further. I only need stuff or what's useful to me is what's been funded by the NIH. And once I've added all of those uh, filters to my search, I'm down to one result and I can read a little bit more about uh, what I can expect to find in here and then open this content and look into what's been provided. There's some files that they have in here. They have a DOI. We'll talk a bit about those in a minute. But um, yeah, so any combination of all of these uh, filters is what, um, what you have available to you in this OSF search. And you can always kind of reset and um, and try these, you know, again, with different filters, if you're not finding quite what you want by just removing the, the breadcrumbs there. Um, so yeah, that is our, uh, the this OSF discovery features that we're really, really pleased to share. And this is just another look at one of those um, search card previews. Uh, in this case, um, this is a pre-registration and you can see um, this context field. So in this case, I entered in my search, many labs is what I searched for, which was the name of a, uh, of a whole collection of projects that were replicating other work. Um, and because that was a search term, um, I have this context field that tells me the title is where that search term appears. Um, and so I get a little snippet of that. If it appeared in the um, like the abstract instead, the context, uh, the context would say abstract and then snag a piece of that abstract that it would preview for me, just like you would expect in uh, the Google searches. Um, it does the exact same thing and italicizes those, uh, my search term in there. It will work the same way for other uh, search terms and, uh, and filters. Um, so very, very neat, useful feature there uh, to see where my results where my search term occurring. Um, I have my dates and contributors information, and then those funder and license and uh, resource type um, information that we looked at in the in the filters here. All of those we give you a preview of, uh, so that you can you know really determine if this is something you want to dig further into and can open up this uh, registration and see all of the details, um, and then. And with registrations, we also have all of those connected resources. So the if you have data and code and materials, papers, other supplements that you've already created, you can create that relationship to with the pre-registration, and you could filter by those uh, in that OSF search. So if you only wanted pre-registrations that had included uh, a relationship to open data, you could do that, uh, and you would only get back pre-registrations who have this badge, this relationship. Um, likewise, if you wanted only things that included all five of them, you could do that as well. Um, so you're getting much, much more precise uh, information uh, returns in your search. Oops, we already did that. Um, so what does that mean uh, for, for those of you that are producing research, sharing research, or you're supporting researchers that are doing it? Um, and a couple of the comments in the chat were, you know, discovery would be great if the metadata could be more consistent. Um, and that is, of course, uh, a terrific point. Um, and, you know, the, we, you're, you're, the term that you're hearing a lot these days um, is fair, fair metadata, fair data, um, which, of course, we take to heart uh, as well. Um, and earlier this year, January, um, we released a number of metadata features, some of which we just talked about, but all of them with the goal of making uh, or enabling research that is added to OSF to be fair. Uh, so being findable, there's a lot of identifiers that we take advantage of. And I'll talk a little bit about those in a minute, um, but metadata that's available for researchers to include um there's a it's all accessible obviously it's a pretty big part of the open science framework um but also standards um 
interoperable, which we've talked a little bit about before, but I'll show you even some some other cool examples that all of you could take advantage of, doesn't require any development. Um, and reusable, so having those licenses like we saw before um, and transparent activity logs or other provenance information. Um, and all of this is, some of this is happening quickly in terms of uh, these are not just good practices anymore. These are expected uh, practices and um, researchers are making these commitments uh, when they get uh, research grants or as the institutions are sometimes uh, even um, uh, are responsible for that compliance. Um, so there's a lot of eyeballs on these needs, uh, of course, right now. Um, and we want to support that. And, um, you know, some of these things are you know, above the surface in terms of um, their increasingly expected and, and visible, um, but that's not really where um, the OSF wants to, to stop. We want to include all of these other pieces that can uh, make that research, enable that research to be fair. So um, good metadata, obviously important, and some consistency and standards there, uh, but these other relationships and good practices um, we really want to include uh, the ability for researchers to take advantage of those as well and include those relationships. Um, so in the, just in one of those OSF projects, like we saw before, you just can see right there examples of um, data that's been you know, submitted, included in that project space. And then there's metadata as well, all in one package um, so that you're, you know, as a consumer, as a reader, or as a funder who's determining if this work is following the practices that the researchers committed to, I can get all of that without having to, to go searching around in different places. Um, and then that also has its own metadata page for even more detailed metadata, like the resource types and the funders, um, so that as much as the researcher is comfortable with uh, documenting, with sharing about their research, we're going to enable and capture that. Um, and we use, uh, whenever possible, standards rather than just free text. Um, so like with the um, resource types here, we're using the data site resource type taxonomy, which is 1415 um, uh, types of research objects. So um, in this case, this was labeled as a collection. They chose that from a, a drop-down list. It wasn't something they just typed in there, which um, is certainly gonna make it much easier to discover collections because you're not having to sort through every kind of spelling of the word collection to find what uh, someone identified their, their object type as. Uh, and likewise, the funding um, support information is coming from the Crossref funder registry I start to type in my funder and it, it includes that funder name and identifier in uh, on my object rather than, again, a free text and who knows what happens when I uh, when they leave me to my devices to just add free text funder names. So we take that out of their hands and, and make it super easy uh, for them to just select their funder. And then that's all powering that search that we saw earlier. Um, so just a, a sense of um, some of the other pieces of that metadata that we're, we're leveraging, and we hope that uh, that researchers are um, comfortable leveraging. Um, most of what we have is, is using the, the data site metadata uh, schema. There's, you know, there's a lot of value and consistency across um, not just our workflows, but in a lot of repositories that, especially data repositories, um, they are using that same data site metadata schema. So it helps the user and then administrators and others um, become more, more comfortable because they're seeing that same, those same standards. Um, and we use controlled lists for, for many of those things where appropriate, like the funders and resource types we mentioned, as well as uh, subjects, disciplines, uh, and others, and the affiliations. Um, we use raw IDs for those. Um, and the other PIDs that we include, obviously, as object um, identifiers with DOIs. The researchers can connect their ORCID IDs to their OSF profiles. 
We have those RUR IDs for the institutions and the Crossref funder registry for those funders. So all of that gets packaged in those same metadata containers um, and are sent to data site when we meant to DOI for that uh, content. Um, and then we enable those relationships that we talked about before. So you can connect if you have early uh, pre-registrations, you can connect your resulting data and papers and analytic code, all of that to the OSF pre-registration, whether that is stored on the OSF or somewhere else, uh, it doesn't matter. We'll enable you to connect it through uh, identifiers um, so that you, you know, you're not forced to just keep using the same platform. If you have a good data repository or something, um, please do use those and then come and add that relationship to your content. Uh, and then we have an application profile just for metadata, um, the OSF map, uh, which outlines all of these standards. So, uh, you know, the, the big part of um, accessibility and, and consistency is that we can document everything that we're doing um, with our metadata. And so there is a public OSF map uh, specifically for that. And you can even add all of these kinds of details. You can add to all the way down to the file level as well. Um, if you have unique metadata that you want to include on your files. And all of this is documented in our, our uh, help center. Um, so hope you, um, you know, if you want to take advantage of those and get feedback on them, please uh, let us know. Um, but, you know, what's critical here is that we realize that discovery doesn't just start and stop on the OSF. Um, so we make sure that the metadata that um, we're enabling the researchers to to add to the OSF actually has a lot of value uh, beyond the OSF. So um, zoomed in here and just one, this is one object in the OSF. We have a, a, a data management and sharing plan that was required as part of an NIH grant that we submitted earlier this year. And we have that plan submitted on the OSF. And in the metadata here, um, we have uh, Nicole, Nikki, who is our um, chief product officer here at COS. Uh, she is the key contributor. She has her ORCID ID connected to her profile. Uh, she has some of those data site uh, fields that we mentioned before. Um, the resource type is an output management plan. She even included uh, the, the language that the resource is in. Um, so that's all going to data site. Um, and then has the Crossref funder ID for uh, the NIH um, and even details on the award title. Um, but that funder uh, name is coming from the Crossref funder registry and then has a license, of course. And so now we send all that to Datasite when she minted the, uh, the DOI for that object. And so we have the uh, license and resource type um, information in here and uh, Nikki's ORCID ID and her affiliation with uh, the Center for Open Science, that all gets captured by Datasite. Um, the, the host um, repository is here. And then that funder and funding specific opportunity are also uh, pulled in. Um, so all of this now is in the Datasite uh, corpus. And because Nikki set up her uh, auto sync with between data site and ORCID, uh, she doesn't have to do anything for this opportunity to now be present on her ORCID record. It just automatically syncs to her ORCID record. We have documentation up um, on the help guides on how to set up that sync, um, but it can be super useful as a researcher uh, to not have to come and update all of this, uh, your ORCID record manually. And that's not what they want you to do either. They really want these relationships set up so that it's um, uh, adding to your record automatically. And so this is one example of, of how valuable that can be, but um, setting up that auto sync between data site and ORCID, you'll get a lot of your content added to your ORCID record without ever having to, to think about it. Um, and you can always come back and hide those or remove them if you, if you really needed to, but um, they'll be added to your ORCID record automatically and have that metadata, that key metadata that was submitted in this case to data site from OSF will be present in there as well. Uh, and then I added just here just to um, show you the representation in the OSF itself. So outside of the OSF and in the OSF, 
we can use those same filters we talked about before. Um, in this case, the resource type and the funder, and that gets me down to um, uh, Nikki's submission here and the preview of some of the things that are in that project. Uh, and just to give you a sense of all the things that are happening when um, in that same workflow, um, this is a, you know kind of a um, silly animation here, but the, the idea is that um, as you or your colleagues are submitting an ORCID record, or excuse me, a piece of content to the OSF, um, you can include your ORCID IDs by syncing those with your uh, OSF profile. And so we take that information about you and the institution that you're part of. And um, as we're minting that DOI for that piece of content that you submitted, we take all of that, those identifiers, uh, we bundle it up, submit it to data site. Uh, and when they mint that DOI, the info gets back to your ORCID record. It has all those same identifiers in it. Uh, they also go, if you use some of our, um, if your institution uses some of our institutional tools, it'll populate in their uh, reports and in their interfaces. And then it's available by way of that same ROAR um, institutional identifier uh, as well. So now it's appearing in many, many uh, places without even a specific other indexes pop, uh, grabbing those up, even though many do grab OSF content um, and share those in their indexes. Um, but they're already now in the data site and in the ROAR, uh, they're available by querying those IDs. Uh, and your ORCID IDs. Um, so just by starting to include those identifiers when you have the opportunity in your funder identifier being another one, um, the uh, amount of ways that your content can be discovered and the relationships that are available in there uh, exponentially grow very, very quickly. Um, and so the search in the OSF is just one place where it becomes much easier to um, if I'm looking for things that were funded by the same funder that your work was supported by, or I'm looking only for data sets and your work is a data set that's labeled as such, um, the data sets also get picked up by the Google data set discovery is just one more example. If you add those, those metadata um, to your, your content. Um, so, you know, a few minutes when you're, you're preparing your data to add that extra metadata these are all of the advantages that come with that. Um, so really, really worth uh, spending that time. Um, there's some cool stuff that's coming pretty soon um, on uh, both the search front and the metadata front. Um, on search, those same features are gonna be added to some of those community operated spaces like the institutions and preprints spaces. Um, and then also those, you know, once you're adding all of those filters to your searches, um, will give you a, a URL that you can use. So you could have a very complex set of core of, um, of filters, take the URL and just hang on to it. And then every time you click that, it'll populate those same filters so that you could get you know that set of results. So if you only wanted content from one institution that's a particular um, resource type and from a particular funder, if you wanted all of those to be the presets, you would just take that URL and just up, you know, click on it, it'll update for you. Um, so really, really neat, nice little feature that's coming um, at the end of this month. And then on the metadata front, uh, we, you know, we we try to really have key metadata items available in the OSF. But as a as a generalist repository that's available to any discipline, um, there's only so specific we can get um, with the kind of metadata the the options that we have for metadata to be. Uh, populated, um, but there are tools that specialize in that, having uh, being able to build uh, community taxonomies for specific disciplines or organizations. Um, CDAR is a, a tool and a group at Stanford who developed such a tool. Um, and uh, one piece that they have is an embeddable uh, editor where, you know, if um, COS were to develop some kind of specialized uh, psychology um, metadata taxonomy, then I, we could build it in CDAR. We would have it enabled in the OSF and you would fill out your general you know, metadata still, but then 
I could pull up this very specialized uh, form by way of this the CDAR integration, and this can have a much more, much different um, uh, metadata taxonomy than what we generally capture. Um, can be much more specific, um, and uh, you know we can work with organizations and with disciplines subjects. Uh, to integrate their their taxonomies into the form so that um, anybody can choose from one of those taxonomies, fill it out, and we would populate that metadata into their uh, OSF content. And then it's searchable and findable in a similar to the way that our, our general metadata are. Um, so we are working on this project right now um, and hope to, to be able to make this available in some of these um, uh, meta are well, some of these taxonomies available by the end of the year um but this is very much in progress so if you want to come and chat with us about it uh please do because uh, we're, we're really excited about this work so yeah i mean the the takeaway is um uh, if you want to take advantage of all these cool discovery features that are available not just in the OSF, but um, outside of the OSF and many, many of the, the largest, most expansive indexes of research. Um, you know, the key is, as was pointed out in some of the comments earlier is um, be consistent about adding metadata to your work. We're, we're trying to make the, um, to use standards in such a way that um, if you take that time, it won't, it won't get too messy because we're we're using a, you know a very specific standards to identify what your resource types are and who your funder is and who your institution is. Um, so it it can't get too uneven. Um, but the more you can include, typically, the the better um, as far as the discovery goes. Um, but one thing I do like to to end these talks with is that you don't have to try to take on all of this all at once because um, there's a lot of these pieces that are, um, you know, more than just adding a little bit of metadata to your data set when you finish. Um, you know, there's more you could do, but you don't have to do that in order to take advantage of a lot of the th things that we looked at today. Um, there are really quick wins that um, you can start to take advantage of quickly, like those um, getting that ORCID ID and using it not just an OSF, but when you when you were given the opportunity to use it uh, and connect it to your your uh, work, um, take advantage of that because the the opportunities for that to to flow um, into a lot of different indexes and workflows and help you in the future is is significant. Um, so getting that ORCID ID and um, connecting it, you know, for the in the OSF, for example, um, right away you're going to have lots of of new opportunities for discovery, syncing that with your uh, with data site is going to help you too because that'll sync things to your record. Um, and then the more you can tell us about your content when you submit it in the OSF, the more likely that um, as other researchers are looking for content like it, um, they're going to use those same standards that we've provided. Uh, in order to discover it. So if you take advantage of them on the, the metadata capture front, then um, you'd be in a really good position to be found by those same methods. Um, so start to take advantage of that. And then you know, as you get more comfortable with, um, with some of those practices, then you might want to start connecting, using some of the relationships, like connecting your, your code and uh, even pre-registering um, your analysis plans ahead of time, kind of like a data management plan, but for your whole analysis, you could do that. Um, and it's pretty, um, it's pretty risk free, uh, but you get a whole set of relationships available to you that you didn't before. Um, so lots of ways to increase that transparency and comply with those, those expectations now um, from funders and policymakers um, by just taking a, a few minutes to just follow the the steps that we've already uh, provided here in the OSF and probably many of the other repositories that you take advantage of. But um, obviously I could speak to what we're doing here in the OSF. So um, that's wrapping up for me. I have some resources here, all the slides, everything we did today um, will all be um, sent to you. Um, and there's some links in here you might wanna check out. Uh, my info is here if you wanna um, chat with me and my team. 
and we're we're happy to talk about um, your experiences with any of this, as well as requests for future um, improvements or or how you might feel like um, your work might be better represented uh, in the OSF and in OSF discovery. So um, really appreciate uh, your attendance today. I'm going to pop open the um, the Q and A here, and I see that uh, there are some questions that uh, my colleague Blaine has already answered. Um, so thank you, Blaine. Um, there's a question from Shannon. Is there a way to search for hedges? I'm not sure I know what hedges are, so um, I might need some context on that one. Um, is the data with uh, search hedges? Oh, uh-huh. Um, so yeah, there's you know, the the easy way for that to to occur would be um, if we have a systematic review template, so a workflow specifically for systematic reviews in the OSF, and one of the filters that's available is which of these templates um, did the user submit. Um, so you could just look at content that was submitted using that systematic reviews uh, workflow. Um, and then you would you know, have that narrowed down already to that point, and then you can continue to filter as as needed. Um, but that would would be the uh, easy first step for that. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat as well. So um, Manosha asks how how are how to get peer review uh, done on on OSF. So um, some of the providers uh, on OSF, some of the, the registries and the peer uh, preprint providers that are run by other communities on the OSF, uh, they have moderation. So it's it's peer review in the purest uh, sense that or you know a peer in your same discipline um, is reviewing and approving or not um, your content, and that it would appear in their service. Um, so that's one example. Um, we also have registered reports workflows, which is a alternate peer review method where um, you would submit information about your study before you go off and write a paper. Um, and journals that accept those um, would review what you've submitted and tell you whether they're, they'll publish your paper, no matter what happens with the actual analysis, um, with the results, they'll they'll publish or not, um, just based on the methods and descriptions that you've submitted. So those are um, those are options that are available to you. We don't do peer review on on things that are submitted to the general like OSF um, corpus, uh, except for determining if it there's violations of our terms of use. In which case, we would remove it. Um, but otherwise, we don't review um, uh, peer review content on the OSF. Um, Marsha is asking a data with DTA file ending SPSS compatible. So um, yeah, it won't, it won't run you know, the SPSS things in the browser. Um, but yes, you could download those, um, those files and they should uh, work as expected um, once downloaded. Um, there are several hundred uh, types file types that do render um, in the OSF, um, but we don't have sort of machine actionable um, computing that's running in the browser. Um, there are some tools that we're developing currently that is going to tackle a bit of that. Um, so I'll have some news on that in another month or so, um, but that's a good question. All right. Any other questions? We're right about at time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. It's really terrific questions and feedback. Thank you. All right. I think we will wrap up then, but please do reach out if you have any other requests or questions and you will get some uh, 
you'll get resources from the session today, um, uh, probably tomorrow. So uh, keep a lookout for that. And I hope to hear from you. Thank you.